So up next is uh, vertical connection, and we'll have the, the electrical engineering students of vertical connection giving a presentation to start, and then Devin Bradburn, their mechanical engineering teammate, uh, will have his own short presentation uh, similar to the previous two. Okay, so take it away. All right, hello, we are vertical connection. My name is Michael Kaneshi, I'm electrical engineering. We also have uh, Naveen, who is electrical engineering, and Matt, who is computer engineering. <laughs> and uh, also we have Devin Bradburn on our team, who is mechanical engineering, who is acting as our consultant, assisting us with the development of the physical aspect of our project. So before we start off, let's summarize what we're going to talk about today. Uh, at the start, we're going to talk about the background, about what problem we're, we're looking at, and then go into the problem statement that we end up developing. We're then going to look at the, the approach we took into selecting uh, a product to develop, and then go into detail about our final selected design. We'll then summarize everything up, and then talk about challenges, challenges we faced, the future outlook of the project, and the impact it can make. So to start off, independence is something we often take for granted. The ability to go up a flight of stairs or go down a flight of stairs, uh, or even take the elevator from the first floor to the second floor. Um, is, these are very simple tasks, but for some, uh, for people with disabilities, they can often be quite challenging. And uh, sometimes it can be actually impossible. And so society has made a huge push in the past two decades towards making buildings more uh, disability accessible. Uh, for instance, uh, most notably is the, the button you see on most public doorways. When pushed, it automatically opens up the door. And that's great. But as a disabled individual, if you were to say go into that building and want to go to uh, the second or third or fourth floor, um, using the elevator or other means might be a challenge. And so uh, to get a, get a better understanding of how big of a problem maybe using elevators will be for d disabled people, we talked to Allison Fox at the Sherbrooke Care Home. Uh, she's an occupational therapist there. Um, Sherbrooke Care Home is a care home here in Saskatoon. It houses about 265 residents, um, of which are elderly or have a disability. And uh, we're pretty surprised to hear what she had to say about it. So about 15 of the 265 residents there are unable whatsoever to independently use the elevators at that facility. And surprisingly, about 100 individuals there have difficulty using that elevator system. And so we talked to one of the individuals uh, at Sherbrooke. His name is Hubert, and he's a quadriplegic and he's not capable of using the elevators on his own independently. And he told us about multiple occasions where he'd be stuck on the first floor later, later at night, uh, waiting for literally hours for someone to come by and help him press just the third floor button so that he can get back to his room. And so this isn't just a problem for Hubert, and this isn't just a problem for Sherbrooke, but this is a problem that stems for many uh, care facilities nationwide. And so this brings us to our problem statement. So individuals with, with physical disabilities that prevent them from independently operating elevators need an on-demand, easy to use, safe, and inexpensive myth method to assist with elevator operation. So when we approached our solution, uh, we had several goals that we wanted to, to kind of make it with. And so that's how we designed our constraints and objectives. Um, <clears throat> for one, we wanted it to be um, inexpensive. We didn't want it to cost the users a lot of money and we didn't want it to cost the facilities a lot of money to implement. Uh, we also wanted to make it uh, reliable, the, the floor selection reliable. We didn't want them accidentally ending up on floor two when they wanted to go to floor four uh, or any situation like that. Uh, we also wanted to make it durable so that we didn't have a lot of maintenance or regular maintenance that needed to happen and we didn't want to modify the physical layout of the elevator so that it would be different for an able-bodied person to use it. Um, we identified three primary system functions, uh, but they're kind of split into two uh, areas, the front end and the back end. So for the front end, we needed to identify that a user was going to use the elevator. Just simply, they wanted to use it. Uh, also in the front end, we wanted to identify the specific floor choice that they were going to make. And then in the back end, uh, we just needed to relay that specific floor choice to the elevator control system to make the elevator operate. 
So as M Matt spoke to, um, there's a back end and a front end. So the back end, some alternative solutions that we looked at. Um, the first was a robotic arm inside the elevator that would simply push the button. Um, this turned out to be quite costly and quite complex. Um, the second solution that we looked at was a wired communication system. So as you can probably tell, there was some problems with that as wiring into a moving elevator is quite complicated and quite costly. Um, so we ended up going with this internal wireless communication. So there would be a server outside the elevator that would send a signal via Bluetooth into the elevator to a Bluetooth receiver that would then make the button selection. Um, this is our front end solutions. We had five here. The first was a near field communication system. Um, it required a mat to be put on the ground, which um, really hurt its chances in that um, the mat is a tripping hazard as well it, it stops chairs and trolleys from rolling over it. Um, Bluetooth triangulation, it was uh, very inaccurate. We were trying to use it to track location of people, but it's quite inaccurate and quite costly. Um, the modified physical button or sensor, um, this we discounted due to the fact that it would impede with able-bodied users. There would be a chance of them accidentally hitting the buttons or um, just impeding their normal use of the elevator. Um, the fourth one here is a remote. Some of the users um, in the facility have a small remote on their chair that they can use to operate the television. Um, the problem with this is not all our uh, users have this remote, and so we would have to custom build kind of a remote for each one and tie into their chair, which is a little bit more complicated than it sounds. Um, the solution we ended up picking was an infrared light solution, and uh, we'll go into more detail here. So what our solution is, is it's infrared lights in the roof, and then there's a sensor on the individual, the user, that senses this infrared light. So what happens is there's three infrared light on the roof. They shine into a specific portion on the floor, which would then be marked with which floor uh, that light corresponds to. So as you can see here, um, this individual is on floor two, and there would be a floor one, floor three, and floor four spot on the ground, and then an LED IR, <laughs> an IR LED, sorry, um, over top of each position. The sensor on their body, as they went under that, that light, would sense the light and send a signal to the, our uh, server saying, you know, I'm under light one, I want to go to floor one or floor three, however they want to choose. That signal would then be sent to the up-down button, depending on which floor they were, and then sent into the elevator to select um, the floor. So we're just going to go into a little bit more detail of this uh, main AB part here. So for the, <clears throat> for the main IR control system, you can kind of see with the, the video over there, we'll, we'll play the video later, but uh, we use a Raspberry Pi as a server uh, on this end, and then we also have a Raspberry Pi uh, as a client, which is worn on the person. Uh, the Raspberry Pi, uh, we coded using Python, running a, a script in there. <clears throat> and what it's doing is it's turning on uh, one of those LEDs for a certain amount of time, then switching to the next one and switching to the next one. It knows which light is currently on, and once it receives a communication over Bluetooth from that client Pi that I was telling you about, um, it turns on the proper motors to select the buttons. Uh, so Naveed can just show you kind of the, the video of these infrared lights being turned on. Now normally you, you can't actually see infrared light, but because of phones and their filters you can actually see this. So that would be invisible to the naked eye regularly. And so just a quick, uh, oh, sorry, <laughs> just a quick uh, hardware description of what's happening here. Um, we're using this 555 timer, which just simply pulses current on and off. We're using a 20 kilohertz signal at 10% duty cycle, so it's only on for 10% of the time. And the reason we're doing this is because these, light have, these uh, IR lights have a fairly low current tolerance, so they can only go up to about 200 milliamps. But using this pulse, we can send about two amps to those lights, and so we get a lot more range out of those IR LEDs. We get about six to eight feet, as opposed to you know, half a foot that you would get with 200 milliamps. Um, moving on, this is the portable IR sensor. So as you can see, this is just the sensor right here, and then the Raspberry Pi is behind it. <coughs> So the IR sensor would detect that IR light. It would then send a signal to that Raspberry Pi behind it, which would then, over Bluetooth, send a signal to the server saying, I've detected light. OK, so then it goes into the button selection system. So initially, we decide, decided on an internal wireless selection system. But because of the time constraints in getting approval to modify the buttons, the electrical circuitry behind the buttons, for the purpose of this project to meet the functions we needed, we developed an external button selection system. 
So with this, we're actually powering motors with an arm to push a button physically. So what this does is when a user is standing under a light and the system realizes that they want to say go to floor three and they're on floor two, then the system would, would send a signal that to our up button. And that up button would be, would be turned on and uh, right here we have our drive for our motor, so we have a forward and a reverse drive. So our forward drive would be enabled and it would press that button and then we get a reverse to bring it back to its steady state. Once the elevator arrives, we send a signal into the elevator, pressing that third button, so making that selection. During this time, that elevator door opens and that individual rolls into or walks into the elevator and then the floor suction was already made for them. Here's a video of the down button being pressed with our system. So it's a very simple system. <laughs> and that's it. All right, on to the next slide. So, but in reality, um, this would be our optimal solution that we'd want to implement. And this would be implemented behind the control panel. So the elevator would look just as it would right now and this would be connected to the actual button on the elevator system. So what this is, is we'll have a Bluetooth module connected to our main control system. When a selection is made, this Bluetooth module initiates a relay and it acts as if it's almost like an electronic button. So rather than physically pressing a button, it's an electronic button in essence that closes and makes that selection. And then we're able to detect when the elevator arrives and has has been selected with other sensors there too. So uh, this is just the overview of the entire system in action. So uh, what this is simulating here is a person on floor two making a selection to go to floor three. So this is the person here on floor two with the sensor. So this is the sensor right there. So as we pan over to the other side, you'll see the IR lights, which are right there, and the motor drive, which is over here. Motor drive. So you see the light turn on, the light that indicates floor three. So floor three right there turns on, sends a signal to the sensor. The sensor then sends a signal back to the motors to press the up button. So it hits the up button, returns back to its original position, then it hits the floor three button, returns to its original position again. So in conclusion, Individuals with disabilities are often unable to operate elevators independently, and this really hampers their ability to move within their living quarters or just hampers their independent independence in general. Sorry. <coughs> a common trait among the, our users, though, is the ability to move from point A to point B on the same floor. And we harness this in our solution um, to make it so that that common trait is what selected the floor for our elevator solution. And our selected solution addresses all the functions that are required for a user to operate the elevator independently. Um, just a quick uh, comment about our cost here. So the system as built right now costs $470. Um, in terms of real implementation, um, with some optimizations obviously, it would be about $1,500, and that's for a four-story building with one elevator. And then each sensor on the user would cost about $20. So some challenges that we faced uh, in our design um, was most notably not impeding able-bodied use. So that was super important for us in that you know, we didn't want an elevator that was only for able-bodied or only for disabled use. Um, we wanted our system to be able to put in, be put into any elevator that's out there right now. And if you're an able-bodied person and you didn't know the system was attached, you wouldn't operate the elevator any differently and you have no idea that the system was in place. Um, the second major challenge we had was getting the floor selection signal into the elevator. So as Mike talked about, we originally wanted to go wireless, but due to some constraints with um, changing the panel in the elevator, um, we had to go with a wired solution. So that's definitely something that we'll um, be optimizing in the future. So in the future, uh, the first thing that we want to do is optimize. We've kind of shown that the entire system works as a whole. Uh, the first thing that we can optimize is the software. Uh, like I said, right now it works, but it can be done better. Our floor selection can probably be done faster. We can tighten up uh, some of our wait times so that it's using less power, running less often. 
Uh, we also want to take that um, sensor that was on the person, and right now that's kind of plugged into the wall using a Raspberry Pi. We can make that smaller, we can get that removed from the wall, and yeah, make that easier. Um, also, adding in that optimal selection circuit using the Bluetooth wireless relay behind the panel like we've been talking about, and so just making the entire system better than what it is right now. Uh, we also want to add additional safety features, like in the instance of if you were to enter the elevator, and for some reason we're unable to leave the elevator, our system would recognize that you haven't left it and either maybe ping one of the occupational therapists or ping a nurse or ping someone working at the care home at the time, just making sure that the person in there gets out safely. Um, and then finally, adding user floor permission controls um, for people, for example, if, if a resident lived on the fourth floor and wasn't allowed to access the third floor, uh, that the system wouldn't allow them to intentionally travel somewhere where they're not actually allowed to be. So the impact of our system is quite wide reaching. So for the elevator manufacturers, by implementing a solution such as, uh, such as ours into their elevator systems, they end, up, they end up creating these disability accessible elevators, which then they can market to uh, care homes and other care facilities and hospitals and, and stuff like that. For the care homes themselves, it's extremely beneficial because they're offering a service that right now currently doesn't exist. It increases the standard of living for residents in there who are not able to use elevators or who have difficulty using elevators. And it also is a time-saving cost for the occupational therapists <laughs> and nurses there um, so that instead of spending time going in to make a button selection for someone that can't, they can continue on with their work. And of course, it, it really comes down to the user and this is where the huge benefit comes from. Um, independence is, is super valuable. Independence is really freedom. And to have freedom is, is something words can't really describe. So, being able to provide this for a user is extremely uh, impactful. And of course, this really does have an impact on society as a whole. As we've seen with um, doorways at public buildings being able to be uh, disability or sorry, to be disability accessible uh, via just the use of a button, really the next step is the movement towards disability accessible elevators or other transportation devices upward throughout a building. Um, overall, what we're trying to do is make, there's gonna be a big push towards making a society that's really accessible to everyone and anyone. And uh, that brings us to the end of our presentation. Thank you very much. And also, at the end of this whole event, uh, we have all of our systems set up in McNaughton, which is 2B54. 54. 54. Uh, and so you're welcome to come by and, oh yeah, 2C54. Welcome to come by and check everything out there too. Our system is not quite as close. <laughs> <laughs>
like n n every device that is in this room pretty much has Bluetooth on it now, and it's very low power, so we could run it on batteries for quite a long time yeah, if you want. Yeah, we even looked into that, and so for using just a single like battery cell um, battery, so the actual device that the user would wear would be about the size of your thumb, a little bit bigger, so it's quite small, and uh, the battery itself can actually power the device for about a month to two months. So. And, and also, we talked to the occupational therapist as to, you know, how much of a burden would this be to uh, applying it to users and stuff and, and replacing batteries and stuff. And she said, if replacing the batteries was less than, you have to do it less than every week, so every couple days, that would become a burden. But anything a week and on is no problem for the benefit it provides. So uh, maybe you can touch upon how your system would uh, deal with a situation where you're in a 10-story building or something. So um, as we get higher and higher, it becomes a little bit more difficult just because you need kind of like a block in front of the elevator to dictate floors. So given a long enough or wide enough kind of runway to deal with, you could do it. But there is sort of a floor cap on how this system could work. You know. It, after a while, it just becomes, it uses up too much space for it to be useful. Um, the other thing, though, is on a lot of those buildings that are that size, um, they have multiple elevators. So you would only really need to do it for one of the elevators, just kind of designate one elevator as that one. So you could use a lot more of the space that's available. You wouldn't have to do it for all of them. And to mention, also, Sherbrooke specifically was just a part of our scope. So we weren't looking at, uh, like, many like high story buildings or anything. So Sherbrook was the facility that we were working with. So we designed it specifically that for them for now. You might want to keep in mind that if, if quadriplegics or other people who can make use of this were in a taller building, they might not need access to all the floors in the building. They'd probably be localized to one or two floors, maybe a service floor or something like that. So it could still possibly work in a taller building uh, depending on the needs of the, of the clients and the users. I was also going to say, uh, when we were talking to Hubert at Sherbrooke, he suggested a system where it rolled through the floors, and so like it would display floor one, floor two, and when you wanted, when you saw the floor you wanted to go to, you could step into the light. But depending on how big the building is, that might take a while. And if you accidentally make a floor selection, now you're going to four floors at the same time. And, but that is another alternative that's that could be possible. Heard. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Another slightly technical question. I noticed that you felt the need to really drive those LEDs. Like you're going to pump an ad through those uh, infrared LEDs. And you know, I'm pretty sure my TV is all the way across the room and I'm not driving those LEDs in that remote control. But this, what, it kind of mentioned that, you know what I'm getting at here. Where, why do you have to drive the LEDs like that? Um, just the ones that we ordered, um, we have to drive them that hard to get that much distance. But the ones actually in your remote, they actually take a lot more current than you think they do, but they use the same pulsing technique that our 555 timer does. So they are pulsed at a much higher volt or current than you'd think they are. Um, but in the future, we would definitely get um, an LED that has a lot higher, specifically rated for you know long distance and high power, so that we could uh, use that without that complicated. Is it, is it a function of focus? Like you have a certain cone you're targeting at the bottom, and could a luminaire uh, help with that problem? Yeah, absolutely. That was actually um, something we, were, uh, we <coughs> ran out of time, but we were hoping to get a cone designed that would then focus it. Because the LEDs right now, um, they have a 10 degree um, span, which isn't actually that big. Like on a 10 foot ceiling, it gives you um, a foot on the ground. So it's pretty small. So um, we would probably put maybe three or four kind of spaced out and then have that cone that directs it all downward. So you still get that smaller space, but you get a lot more um, evenly distributed light on the ground. I'm just thinking if you're dealing with quadriplegics, chances are they're confined to a wheelchair, most like an electric wheelchair. So did you look into the options of maybe powering it off the electric wheelchair and mounting the sensor correctly to that? Uh, we did. One of the big issues with that is almost all the chairs are different. And as well, as soon as you start tying into an existing system, liability becomes a huge issue because you know if something goes wrong with the chair then our tying into it is a big so i mean in the future definitely down the road that might be an option when we talk to chair manufacturers specifically but in terms of the scope of this project tying in was just too dangerous in the fact that like l l we could be liable for 
any damage that could be caused. Okay, well, I hope uh, I'd ask you all to join me in thanking Vertical Connection. Okay, up, up next with our fourth and final presentation here this afternoon. We have uh, Devin Bradford, he's a mechanical engineering student, fourth year, and he's been working with Vertical Connection. As you saw in the presentation from Vertical Connection, they needed a way of activating the elevator buttons without a person doing that directly. And Devin was responsible for making the mechanical subsystem that allowed that to happen uh, with a nice little elegant solution that he is going to introduce to you. Thank you very much. So as uh, was said, I'm part of Vertical Connections and I'm the mechanical subcontractor for this project. So my main responsibility was to do whatever they needed me to do in regards to any mechanical systems that involve 3D printing or making or 3D modeling. So ultimately what I was looking at building was this button pushing device that could allow them to take their control signals and ex uh, expand that into an actual physical uh, button push. So about two years ago, my dad was at Sherbrooke. Uh, he was actually helping out a lady who was actually trying to operate the elevator on the third floor, but she was paraplegic. Knowing that I was in a student club, she actually mentioned to my dad that it would be great if she could have something that would actually solve this problem for her because it was a big, it was a big deal for her because she was stuck on the floor and she needed my dad. So now going forward, when we initially started this problem, we were looking at initiating or integrating it directly into the electrical control panel because that's the simplest. You know, you don't need any outside third party devices. But what we really found was a problem is that we didn't have really good literature uh, on the the legality or the liability uh, resulting in if we did integrate inside of these electrical components and we couldn't communicate very well with the elevator companies. They just weren't retu returning our calls. So in order to both create a project for myself and, <laughs> and to uh, really create a proof of concept that could work, we created, I, I created this button device that could translate their commands. So going forward, what I'm going to talk about today is that problem, that external device that I needed to create. I'm going to talk about how I went about doing that. I'm going to talk about the ultimate final design, the incorporations, the details that go into what you see before you. And I'm going to talk about the steps that I think we could take to actually implement this design more in the future through other organizations and other help and other things like that. So going forward, this is my long problem statement, but the main points that you guys can take away from this are that it operates externally. That's important. So that's taking away any internal liability of actually engaging in the electrical components. So essentially just replacing what a person already does, just pushing the button. There's no problems with that. Now, taking commands from vertical connections, that's important. That was more on their side, but providing a means for them to actually relay their commands, as well as making the button select mechanically. So that was involving a, a motor arm or some form of mo motor that could actuate uh, a, a command. And I also didn't want to interfere with normal use. Now that I'm creating a third party device that's in between a normal person and the button, you don't want to cause any problems. You don't want them to you know, not be able to use the elevator now because I now allowed disabled people to use it. So it, that was very important for me. So in order to do this, I, uh, before I came up with any objectives, I come, or any alternatives, I created a list of objectives that I wanted to really maximize in my design. I wanted it to be adaptable most of all to different designs, and not just Sherbrooke, but to other elevators. So make the design at least have capability of being adapted to a variety of different circumstances. As well, I wanted to use as few parts as possible while I was designing this because it's really important in the short time frame that I had, about a month or almost two months to make this, that I wanted to be able to create a proof of concept. And uh, having as few parts as possible was really important to me that I could actually build something, test it, redesign it, and rebuild it. And as well, I wanted to operate fast because if it's not fast enough, it's not durable, and if it's not quiet, then why is a person even going to want to use it? They're just going to still call on the person to come push the button for them or, you know, you're not really solving the problem then. As well, I wanted it to be visually uh, like trustworthy. I wanted it to be visually appealing so that a person actually feels like they're comfortable pressing that button and they don't expect it to blow up in their face or something unfortunate. You know, that would be unfortunate. So I came up with three main alternatives. Uh, it was on a little bit of a rush time frame, but what it ultimately came down to was these three main ones. So using a solenoid, that was the first alternative we tried. We actually bought a few, but and they didn't turn out to be strong enough to really push the buttons like we expected, and they were too large for the ultimate size. 
So then we looked at using a motor arm lever, like what you see in front of you, was, which I incorporated in my final design. I didn't necessarily like this design because it had problems with reliability and maybe problems with durability in the long run because you're constantly running a motor. And, uh, too much friction might be in the system. It was I, uncertainty. And then also the linear actuator was a third consideration. I'd built some over the summer using 3D printed parts and they didn't seem to operate fast enough, but it was still an alternative I wanted to look into. And ultimately though, I, w I went with the, the lever arm design as you can see. Uh, all these designs, so I, I wanted to talk about uh, if the, there's like the able-bodied portion and the disabled body portion and pressing a button. You, should they be connected or should they be independent? Should you require power for both uh, pressing of the button of the able-bodied person or the disabled? You know, that was something I want to consider. And as well, I wanted to see if this should be optimized for Sherbrooke or if this should be optimized for everyone. You know, be good for Sherbrooke and okay for everyone else. But ultimately, in my final design, I decided that it should be a separated system between able-bodied and between disabled people. As well as I decided that it should be modular so that it can be designed for one button and be applied across a variety of different scenarios. And as well, it should be optimized for Sherbrooke so that what that means is that the button itself or the, the motor works explicitly really well for the Sherbrooke elevator and we tested it there and as well it's meant for their size of button arrangement and other things like that. But it doesn't mean that the design can't be modified or changed to different elevators. It's all very easy to do. So in regards to separable, what I mean by that is that I created a, f a fail safe and that if the power ever runs out or other things, the, I created a false button system which is a red button. So able-bodied people can press that just like normal and it just actuates the button. As well, the motor actuated button allows disabled people to do that as normal. So the final design has four main components. It has the false button, which is the red one. It has the button frame, which holds everything together and provides an anchor to attach to the wall. And a servo motor, which then actuates the motor arm <laughs> seen here. So the main components and main details of this is that I, cr I 3D printed this so that in the time, uh, tight time frame that we had, I could quickly readily uh, redesign and test out different options. We found that the first motor arm I made wasn't, uh, was too long and didn't provide enough force. So I redesigned it quickly within a couple days and was able to get that out into production. I was able to build, as you can see, uh, I think I have four here, but I have like another five uh, other ones built just in the other room. So it's you know quite easy to build more and more if you need. So that was really nice. As well, the button frame, pr everything is just snap in. There's like you can use glue, but you don't need to use glue, so it's easy for quick assembly and changing. And it has a flat bottom, so you can just stick it right to the wall. Uh, the servo motors, uh, we selected those for uh, availability. Uh, Rick was kind enough to provide those with me from the Hardy Lab, and they provided enough force upon testing, so we just decided on our tight time frame to quickly apply those and get those working. And the motor arm, uh, as I said, was easy to change and customizable depending on the amount of force we wanted to apply to the motors, or to the buttons. So upon testing, we actually built these brought them to Sherbrooke, and they were able to stick to the panels. They were able to be placed correctly uh, inside and outside the elevator. As well, we were able to actuate the buttons uh, with the servo motors, and we were able to actuate it with the false button. So here's it being placed uh, on the outside and on the inside of the elevator. So you can see there's plenty of room for implementing these, and it's all nicely spaced out. As well, we were able to successfully press these buttons with the motor. So that's, that was kind of nice. That was a really nice moment for Mike and I when we were there. It was a nice little cheer. It was like, whew, we actually got these to work. So another step right now, these were powered by like a small lithium battery. So it, they are relatively small batteries. They're not huge. Uh, with their control panel, if we modified it and made it small, it could easily just fit on the wall above the heads of everyone else. So that wasn't a huge problem. Uh, going forward though, there's a few things that I'd like to do. Like if you, if you notice, they're pretty big, you know, they stick out of the wall. They don't have to. I built it for convenience, for time frame. I have this, the side panels of the button open so, different pe so you can see how it works. It was proof of concept, you know, make it work kind of thing. So there's a spring within each of the buttons so it works nice and cleanly. As well as uh, I'd like to introduce seals within this. In the final design, I think it would be great if you could have this easily cleaned so that it fits within their normal cleaning schedule so that if any water or anything gets in there, it can just be wiped out or washed down even. 
uh, as well as I'd like to maybe make the buttons even bigger. Like you could make them, you know, like if you see on phones for old people, they're like two inches tall. Like, you know, like it might be easier for them to then see the buttons if they don't even have to activate them with a the servo. And uh, lastly, the buttons right now are fairly inconsistent. They all work, but they're all kind of like some are harder than others. So using more consistent springs would be great. And to actually implement this, I'd like to integrate uh, my student organization's Ask Invent. I think this would be a great next year project for them. And I think it would take around three or four months. Worst case scenario, it's eight months, which is a school year. And I think we could actually get this implemented. So I'd like to get the vertical solutions uh, like method portable so we can actually bring it to Sherbrooke, test it out there, get opinions on uh, like how the users actually like it. I wanted to then like modify it and increase it and redesign it so that it's fully enclosed, get the seals working, and then uh, do more tests, do larger sample size, and upon uh, everything like that, then do a full implementation and run it for an extended period of time upon their approval. And I think we could find easy funding and stuff so that Sherbrooke probably wouldn't even have to pay for this. But uh, in end, I talked about the, my problem, which was the uh, creating an external solution that could take their controls and actuate that externally. Uh, and I talked about how I solved it, coming up with the three alternatives, seeing how that could all be related and the problems associated with each, as well as I talked about the final design, which you see in front of you, and that's the 3D printed button uh, using the lever arm. And then lastly, uh, testing and the uh, thankfully successful results that we had that we could actually go out and test this if we wanted even if we can't you know create the electrical integrated system we still have this to fall back on and it works so that's nice and then implementation that's the next step so if we ever do want to take this further we can so thank you very much I'll take any questions all right so questions for Devin Rick. Maybe I'll start. Yes. First off, um, it's good to see those little motors getting used. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, based on the idea that everything in our life has some kind of a standard associated with it, is there any standards, do you think, really on the look and feel and the operation of that manual button that you might need to conform to? I don't think there is because when you look at every elevator, they're actually all unfortunately different. So that was why I had to make it all modular. Uh, so like. Unfortunately, this design, well, I don't think we've actually tested the new design on the engineering uh, building button, but it's actually like a steel button rather than a plastic button. It has a different spring force, different size, it's circular, not square. It's like, it's all over the place. So that was, yeah, that was an unfortunate indication. Yeah. <laughs> so building on Rick's question, um, and I know this was not the focus of your project, but maybe you speculate. Yeah. You've made a device which can be activated using electric uh, current to, to press a button. Yep. It, one could imagine that that might have broader uses than this, just this specific application. It could, could, have you thought of anywhere maybe this could be used in another application? So providing a, another button pushing device elsewhere in Society? Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, sure. <laughs> Something like that. Okay. <laughs> sure. uh, I, I haven't directly thought about it. More remote button pushing occur. <laughs> I'm sure you could use this for automation. Like, that would be easy. Instead of having someone run around and push buttons, you know, on machines that are specifically designed to have operators, you could probably implement this using the Bluetooth like what we have and just have it stick it on the, every button you need. Any other? <laughs> Matt, Matt has a question. Well, I was just wondering, um, with with this design, we've kind of covered the the button which at Sherbrooke lights up, right? Yeah. Is there a way that we could provide visual feedback still to everybody that's using it? I think we could. Yeah, we have the electricity, so if it if you have like a small button on it, activates a small switch which activates light, or you make the button transparent. I had a somewhat similar question, and I say, yeah, make the button transparent or use some optics to get the light out there so you don't yeah. need the battery again. Uh, but the other thing about optics is I noticed when you're putting in the elevator, of course, a lot of times the, the uh, buttons are labeled. Yeah. Like up, down, outside is not bad, but in there you got one, two, three, four, stuff like that. Yeah. So for the sake of the people who can see, uh, would you just like relabel your buttons that you put on there, or, or what? So what you could easily do is just extend the left side or the right side of the frame out a bit and just make out those labels again. Those are just, yeah, you, they're just interchangeable labels. And it's, we, there was also an opportunity maybe 
to actually, instead of sticking this to the control panel, to take those uh, the labels out and then insert it the same way that those are inserted, and that would be your anchor point. But it'd be pretty easy, because actually right now they don't cover up the, the labels when you turn them vertically. Uh, although they do are a protrusion, you could easily just 3D print a, a label next to it. So that's not a big problem. Yep. You may have just answered my question, actually, but uh, I'm just wondering, you're mounting these on the panel externally. Yeah. Well, if there's some kind of a standardized connection on the pa on the buttons that are already there, mm -hmm. if you could develop this so that it's actually within the panel? Yeah, so that was what we were unfortunately trying to avoid because we didn't know if there was liability associated with doing that because we weren't sure if we did like open up the panel, screw around with electronics, what would happen? Would we be liable f if something went wrong? They have a super high reliability like requirement. It's like 99.5 other nines and it's we didn't want to concept, yeah, I can understand you want to do that. Yeah. Anyway, for say future commercialization. That that's one thing that I'd like to do is like talk to the elevator companies, see if they would work with us, see what they would want to do. Just to go add on to that, so that's kind of also what we discussed in our presentation with actually implementing the electrical relay in the back end. And so we have talked to uh, some elevator manufacturers. And all it really would require is reviewing the specs of what we, what kind of modification we'd want to make with it, and then having an elevator like technician to come inspect and review those modifications, as long as they're approved by the manufacturer. So everything in real life we want it behind there, so that everything would look as normal, yet we can operate electrically. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned that sometimes you know the motor doesn't push hard enough to press the button. And you know, maybe eventually one of these motors breaks out or something. Um, is there any room in the design to kind of have a feedback loop and check whether the button has actually been pressed? Uh, I'm sure you could. You could introduce like a, a, a either a sensor on the actual arm, or like the guys have that because all yeah, that talk about. They we talk actually, about the so we have a photo transistor that will will mounts into like into there, and so when you push the button, it that button emits light. And so we read that light, and that gets sent to our device. And so that actually allows us to control when to send signals. So when, when the up button is pressed, it turns on, and the light turns on. That tells our system that the elevator is not there yet, and that it's going to be coming. When the light turns off, the elevator has arrived. And then our system then knows that the elevator has arrived. And then we can send the signal to the elevator. Well, I think we'll wrap it. Oh, sorry. I'm going to a final comment. It just struck me when you talk about other applications that the people who need to use this button can't push the button open those doors either, yeah. which is an obvious yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 And I must add, like, if Devin wasn't able to produce this button that actually like worked for us, we would not have a fully functioning system. So thank you to Devin. Yeah. Okay.